Warning, this episode contains brain food that will lead to improved emotional and social intelligence. Give us one hour and we'll help you change the way you think about happiness. Harvesting Happiness with Lisa Cypress Kamen is fresh, optimistic, and purpose-driven media that promotes well-being from the inside out. Each week, Lisa spotlights diverse trendsetters and change agents who are the greatest contemporary thinkers and doers, devoting their lives to creating a better world in which to live. Your host, Lisa Cypress Kamen, is a widely recognized applied positive psychology expert, author, documentary filmmaker, and lecturer specializing in optimal lifestyle management. Let's get to it. Here's Lisa. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Thanks for joining me on today's show, where you will learn about personal agency and positive disruption. My first guest is Dr. Paul Knapper, and this conversation was originally broadcast in March of 2021. He leads a management psychology practice. He's also an author. His client list includes Fortune 500 companies, nonprofits, universities, and startups. Dr. Paul Knapper has held an advanced fellowship during a three-year academic appointment at Harvard Medical School, and we're talking about his new book, The Power of Agency, The Seven Principles to Conquer Obstacles, Make Effective Decisions, and Create a Life on Your Own Terms. Paul, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. It's great to have you. Let's talk about the definition of agency because people will say, well, I think I know what that means, but what does it mean in reference to our own lives and determina- self-determination? It's a great place to start. And agency, as it turns out, is not that familiar to most people. And what it refers to is it's a concept that has been studied by sociologists and psychologists and philosophers for decades more on the academic side. So if you don't know what it means, don't sweat it. It's fairly new to to the average person. But what it means is it's our capacity to make decisions in our lives for ourselves and take our lives then in the desired direction. So it's the capacity to make decisions and then act act on those decisions in our lives. So basically, we're being an agent and representative of our own best interests. That, that's exactly right. And and for people who are close to the entertainment industry, you know, everyone knows what a sports agent is or a literary agent or, you know, an actor's agent, you know, somebody who, who, who helps you, right? Somebody who guides you, helps you manage your career, helps negotiate contracts. You know, so it turns out we all have an, an agent within ourselves that we can activate to help us to advocate for our own selves. And agency gets at that idea. So it's this capacity to make independent, you know, decisions and then act with confidence on on those decisions. And so what we write about is there's a lot of things that get in the way of our ability to access that inner agent. I want to ask a question about that. Uh, And when we talk about things that get in the way of our own agencies, are you talking about thoughts and feelings? We're talking about a lot of things, but yes, thoughts and feelings are, as it turns out, we are, as humans, we're more emotional creatures than we are thinking creatures. So there's a lot of research that's been done over the last 30, 40 years on how we actually think as human beings, how we make decisions in our lives. So there's a lot of new ground to cover for for people, I think, to get more familiar with, with all of that. But, you know, we like to say that in so many respects, each and every one of us is the sum total of all the decisions we make over the course of our lives. And so how we make choices in our lives, which is, again, what agency is all about, becomes that all defining thing. And and how we think, you know, patterns in our thinking, patterns in, in terms of our emotions, how we feel, how we make sense of our feelings, all of these things affect our level of agency. And when we talk about thoughts and feelings, although they are very much a part of what makes us up or contributes to our behaviors, they don't always contribute to the best decision making because they are not fact based. That's right. And, you know, we as humans, you know, how we generally think and make decisions is 
through intuition, which is shocking to, to, many, to most people because most people think, well, I, you know, I don't think of myself as necessarily a, a highly intuitive thinker. But in fact, most of the decisions we make uh, are, are through what's called fast thinking. Uh, fast thinking is, is more automatic. It's more, you know, again, more intuitive. Um, it's, which is kind of rule of thumb, you know, just something feels a lot like something else. And so we're kind of off to the races making decisions for smaller decisions, like, you know, what kind of vegetables should I you know, buy at the grocery store today? Um, you know, obviously it's not so consequential for larger decisions, more important life decisions, the capacity to think more logically for ourselves I mean, to use, to fully use our reasoning skills as people, you know, becomes a lot more important. And what, what can happen is a lot of people, um, haven't developed that skill, right? They haven't learned how to do the pivot from thinking more intuitively versus, you know, engaging in more, more of their critical reasoning. So some of our listeners might think, well, that just sounds a little woo woo here when we're talking about the, the intuition, you know, trusting the gut, but the research really backs up what you are saying. Absolutely. No, the research is clear. I mean, we, we have uh, several chapters in the book that delve into all of this. This is based on the research of uh, primarily of Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky, you know, two very well-known psychologists who did a lot of research on how humans uh, use re reason and how they actually uh, make decisions. And so it's based on science. It's based on research. And what we try to do in our book is bring this down to earth so people can make, you know, practical sense of it and actually use these important research findings in their lives each, each and every day to make better decisions. So agency plays a huge role in every area of our life, the way we partner, the way we parent, the way we perform at work. Talk a little bit about ways that one can strengthen agency. When you said it, you know, very well, our level of agency affects every aspect of our lives. It affects the quality of our work, uh, the quality of our relationships. It certainly has a direct bearing on our level of happiness. It, it, as it turns out, you know, it feels good to have agency, to use agency, to have access to our agency. I mean, you can think about agency as, you know, the sort of pathway to your own personal power and creativity in your life. So when it's blocked, when you feel stuck, you feel adrift, you know, you feel thwarted, it's not a good feeling. And what we found is a, a lot of people are in that, find themselves in that place today. The word that keeps bubbling up is overwhelm. People feel overwhelmed so much more of the time today than ever before. And when you feel overwhelmed, for extended periods of time, it by definition raises anxiety levels. And when anxiety level increases, you know, it compromises our capacity to, to think and reflect. So we have put together seven principles in the, our book, boiled it down to the, the absolute most essential things for people to focus on that help them to regain sort of a, a calm and centered footing in their lives so that they can better access their thinking skills and make better decisions and then obviously act with greater confidence and get get unstuck and, and also experiencing experience less overwhelm. Can you share those seven points? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'll, I'll run through them kind of briefly. If you want to touch on any of them, we can come back to them. Yeah, definitely. The first one, they, they sound a little wonky. I mean, maybe a little because they're kind of they're sort of science based. I mean, the book is Again, it's, very, it's based on sound science and research. Um, the first principle is called, we call control stimuli. So this is about, you know, controlling what gets into your brain, which is, you know, being a gatekeeper for yourself in terms of not allowing an excess amount of stimulation to enter your brain. The second principle we call associate selectively. This is about surrounding yourself with people who are encouraging, who are supportive, people who help you learn new things, people who challenge you. The third principle we call move. Move is about taking care of your physical health. 
It's about in, ensuring that you engage in an appropriate amount of movement ac- and activity, not, not necessarily just exercise, but just movement, physical movement in your life, that you eat healthy food, that you rest adequately, and that essentially you are taking care of the physical functioning of your body. The fourth principle, and then those first three, by the way, we call the behavioral principles. They're more about how you behave. And, you know, they involve choices you make about about specific behaviors you engage in. The last four principles are we call cognitive principles. They involve how you think and how you process emotion. So the fourth one we call position yourself as a learner. This is about understanding better how you learn in your life, you know, everyone learns differently and some people learn better through some modes than others. So it's understanding better how you learn. And it's, it's also about how to more actively position yourself to learn each and every day in your life. The fifth principle we call manage your emotions and beliefs. This is, <laughs> I'm laughing. <laughs> right. And this is one of the harder ones, <laughs> as you, as I know, you know. I know. <laughs> um, this, again, it's back to the whole idea. We are emotional creatures. How we manage our emotions and our beliefs becomes a really critical determinant to how much agency we have in our lives. So this idea of of emotions can't be entirely controlled, but they actually can be managed. And, you know, the way to manage them is first, you know, obviously to identify uh, what I'm feeling, try and get a gauge on why I'm feeling it. And, and then thirdly, you know, what do I do with it? Do I, do I need to act on it? Do I need to just let it pass and fade away? You know, so this principle essentially focuses on, on self-awareness. Beliefs are something also that, you know, how we how we as human beings develop beliefs, why we develop beliefs, what function it serves in our lives, and also how to utilize our beliefs to help us rather than hinder us. Because at certain times, beliefs become self-limiting. Yes. You know, beliefs are meant to up be updated as we learn more and grow as humans. A lot of times people don't know that. They don't update their beliefs frequently enough and, and, and consequently they're held back. So that's that's probably one of the most challenging of the seven principles. The final two principles, the sixth one we call check your intuition. So this gets into how you make use of intuition. We start with what intuition is, what it's not. A lot of people don't understand really what intuition is, right? I mean, a lot of people like you alluded to earlier, um, you know, think it's fluffy. It's like, what is it like uh, akin to astrology? Is it? Yes, yes, uh, yes. (laughs) Like reading my horoscope every day? Well, no, actually intuition is a, a very important part of how we think. And if we understand what it is and how to access it and use it in in the best ways in our lives, it can really improve the quality of, of the choices we make. The seventh and final principle we call deliberate, then act. The whole idea of deliberation is to reflect on something and also employ critical thinking skills. So critical thinking skills have been now defined as one of the most important skills of the 21st century. So our ability to use logic and reasoning as we make important choices, you know, just decisions that are going to have life changing effects on, on ourselves. Um, you know, this is a skill that we absolutely need for the 21st century. So this last final principle of agency goes into great length on how experts, other experts in fields where they're required to make important decisions, how they actually make those decisions and how you can learn from them. We're going to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to continue the conversation with Dr. Paul Knapper. We're talking about his new book, The Power of Agency, The Seven Principles to Conquer Obstacles, Make Effective Decisions, and Create a Life on Your Own Terms. To learn more, please visit powerofagency.com. And on Twitter, you can connect with Paul Knapper at Dr. Paul Knapper. We'll take that brief pause and then we'll return to the conversation with Paul Knapper. Before we take that break, let's talk about summer sadly winding down and that it's time to get back down to business. How are you planning to gear up for fall and attract the right people to your team to help your business fire on all cylinders? 
Right now, our team is actively seeking advisory board members for a startup venture, and LinkedIn Jobs is my go-to network to find the right talent. Create a job posting in minutes on LinkedIn Jobs that will reach your network and beyond to the world's largest professional network of over 810 million people. Then, Add your job and the purple colored hashtag hiring to your own LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring so your own network can help you target the right people to hire. Simple tools make it easy to focus on attracting the right skills and experience so you can quickly evaluate and prioritize your best candidates. That is why small businesses everywhere rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering high quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn jobs helps you find candidates you want to talk to faster. Did you know every week nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn? Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash HH. That's linkedin.com slash HH to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Now let's take that break. We'll be right back. And that is a promise. To learn more about cultivating sustainable well-being at home and the office, visit harvestinghappiness.com and explore Lisa's experiential on-site brain fitness workshops, corporate programming, and speaking engagement services. And we're back continuing the conversation with Dr. Paul Knapper that originally aired in March of 2021. We're talking about personal agency and positive disruption. Let's get back to it. So, Paul, we're talking about being agent self, like how we can be the best advocate for our own best interests, whether it's for ourselves, our families, or in our businesses, in our companies. Talk a little bit about how a high level of discernment, and I'm going back to the seventh point in this process, which taps into critical thinking, how discernment really is a requirement and how discernment is something that many of us lack. We could use a little strengthening of that emotional muscle. Absolutely. No, this is, this is a very important point. I mean, one of the things we, we talk about a lot in the book is that, you know, we, we all are trying to adapt to the demands our environment places on us. So whether we're talking about our family lives, our business lives, you know, whatever we do in our lives, there are demands around us that we are being required to adapt to. And the first order of business is to make sense of of those demands. What is occurring around me? Can I define it? Can I define it accurately? And can I then figure out what it's requiring that I do about it? So in business, what that essentially involves is, is the capacity to define reality and then to make discerning judgments based on what, what the reality is. So similarly in, in people's personal lives, making sense of what is happening and what you should do about it becomes a, you know, a very essential uh, matter of not just survival, but really a matter of how much happiness and fulfillment people have in their lives. And it's become more challenging to make sense of the environment that we all inhabit. You know, we, what we say in our book is you know, we're all in over our heads these days yeah, from, a true. Cognitive stand, from a cognitive standpoint, there's so much information coming at us. You know, it's kind of a cliche right now to, to say, oh, yeah, we live in the information age, but we do. And what it means to live in the information age is that more and more information comes at us every day. And it's our capacity to make sense of that and actually make discerning judgments that defines the quality of our lives, whether it's our personal life, whether it's our work life. So how we do that, you know, and we actually, one of the, one of the people we interview in this very last uh, chapter, the the chapter on deliberate then act, uh, we interview a judge, uh, a woman who talks about a, a very difficult decision she had to make where she struggled to make a, a discerning judgment. It actually involved a trial that she was presiding over as the judge. And it was a murder trial and there were all kinds of emotions whipping around and how she was able to, in the midst of all that pressure, make a discerning judgment, how, how she how she went about doing that 
is something that that all of us can learn from because you know there are people who make life and death decisions each and every day as part of their work and we can learn a lot from those people because you know they have so much on the line that the quality of their judgments you know matters uh, so greatly that um, they've learned over time to uh, become better decision makers, to make more discerning judgments. So for, for, for all of us, this is this is a really important thing. And, and there's a lot of there's a lot in our book about how do we do this? I mean, how do we put this into practice so that we can arrive at more discerning judgments? So, Paul, talk a little bit about the judge's process of fine tuning her own agency in her decision making process, because when you're talking about holding someone's life or death in your hands, in the case perhaps of a, of a murder trial, there must be some very interesting steps that she takes. Well, first of all, the decision that she needed to make in this case, in this trial, was whether to offer bail as a possibility. So uh, to allow the person to be able to post bail and be released. In most murder trials, that's kind of unheard of. Most In most murder trials, people are not allowed to go out on bail. In this case, it was very complex because the woman who was being charged was a mother, a single mother with a child at home. And this judge knew, she knew that this was going to have profound effects not just on the woman being charged, but also on a young child. So she basically, how she went about trying to make a discerning judgment is she looked at precedent, you know, how frequently is bail, you know, given to to murder trial suspects. Second, she also surveyed the facts of the case. She, she got herself to a quiet place and really did a deep dive on all the known facts around this case to try to get a gauge on what is the you know what is the likelihood that this person is guilty of this crime and and how much re- look like ba- exists based on the facts secondly she surveyed other judges she talked to some other judges and got their thoughts and their impressions and their opinions um third she she gave <clears throat> thought as well to the prevailing environment it just so happened this trial was occurring in, in a, during a time in America where it was a real tough on crime, you know, kind of zeitgeist when, you know, there was a lot, you know, being written in the media about how important it was to be tough on crime. So she knew if she issued this woman bail, there may be a strong backlash. So she she kind of got her ducks in a row and she gave a lot of thought to all the most relevant variables. And she also checked her own emotion and she tried to prevent herself from being biased. So she's, you know, she was aware, uh, emotionally self-aware of the fact, hey, this woman being charged with murder um, is also a, a, a woman, also a mother. And, and she understood, the judge understood she could relate very much to that person, but she also didn't want to allow any of those feelings to cloud her judgment. So she kind of weighed all of this, all of these factors, and she ended up coming to a decision to grant the woman bail. Uh, so the woman was able to, to be out on bail and take care of her child while she awaited trial. And it turned out in the trial itself, um, you know, that the woman was acquitted of all charges and she said she felt a really great sense of, of, of relief, the judge, at the end of the trial because um, the prosecutor in the case, she said, made it very clear that he thought that justice had been served. And in, in other words, that this woman, this woman was in fact not guilty of having committed that crime. So, you know, but she made a decision, a, a tough decision that went against prevailing norms. So, you know, she made a discerning judgment that again was a tough decision to make because she knew she was going to get a lot of flack for it. But she stuck to her guns. She made the decision. And at the end of the day, she felt really good about the decision she made. It's interesting because as you're telling the story, uh, uh, the words that pop into my mind is that she went through a collaborative process to get to that agency. In other words, that she outsourced support. You know, she she approached it from several different angles, not just, oh, what is my gut telling me? The gut played into it after she had done her homework, after she had done the research. 
That's right. No, she used multiple levels um, of of intelligence here um, to both, you know, check on her intuition, but also um, use critical reasoning skills and 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 really do a deep dive on all the actual known facts in the case. She reached out to other judges and you know trusted advisors to her and got some of their thoughts and their guidance. Um, and she also had a level of emotional awareness where she tried to check her own bias, right? Because yeah. she was she feeling just a you know a sense of of identification with this this younger woman who was on trial, and was that guiding her um, decision in the in in the wrong way because she identified with this person? So she tried to keep all of those things in check, and I think again what was so satisfying to her in this in this one particular case is that at the end of the day it worked out really well she she was able to make an independent decision on her own to grant bail and allow this woman to take care of her child and ultimately the woman was cleared of all charges so obviously she felt she made had made the best decision let's talk a little bit about how this translates to the so it translates to the personal level because you know I mean you mentioned several times about the correlation of agency and happiness and because you know the show is harvesting happiness we probably need to kind of circle back to that that what we tend to feel most happy when we feel most in charge of ourselves and our lives that's exactly it you you know you hit on that and that's actually a very profound thought that you just stated there very very simply and matter of factly it turns out that when we have access to our agency, it feels really good. Yeah. <laughs> the reason for that is because, you know, we feel more confident and we feel more in charge and we feel more free uh, to act in, in our lives. So, you know, the whole idea of agency is developing the capacity to think more clearly uh, for yourself and make more independent choices, more independent decisions in your life that take your life in the desired direction, the direction that's most meaningful to you. And at the end of the day, all the research on happiness correlates to this idea of when when people feel they're doing something meaningful with their lives, they feel a much greater sense of happiness and fulfillment. So that's really at the end of the day, the gold standard is, am I doing with my life what feels most meaningful to me? Is, is it in accord with my values and my interests? Am I having fun? Am I feeling a sense of, of confidence that I can that I can take action in my life? Um, because when you do, the chances are you're feeling much happier. Dr. Paul Knapper, thanks for joining us on the show. To learn more about Dr. Knapper's work, please visit powerofagency.com. The book we were speaking of today is The Power of Agency, The Seven Principles to Conquer Obstacles, Make Effective Decisions, and Create a Life on Your Own Terms. To connect with Dr. Knapper, please do so on Twitter at Dr. Paul Knapper. Paul, thanks for joining me on the show. Please come back and hang out with me. There's so much more to talk about. A terrific start to the discussion. And uh, thanks again. You asked great questions. Really, really enjoyed it. Oh, thanks. Here comes that pause. We'll be right back. And that is a guarantee. Did you know that happiness is actually good for your health? Happy people live longer, are more productive, and make better partners, parents, and professionals. Connect with us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness. And follow Lisa on Twitter at Lisa Kamen for a daily dose of inspiration. We're back continuing the exploration of personal agency and positive disruption. My next guest is Daniel Burris, and this conversation originally aired in June of 2018. Daniel Burris is hailed as one of the world's leading futurists on global trends and innovations. He has delivered more than 2,800 keynote speeches worldwide and is a strategic advisor who has guided executives from Fortune 500 companies as well as small and medium-sized businesses to develop paradigm-shifting strategies for capitalizing on enormous untapped opportunities. 
Burris practices what he teaches. He started six companies, four were national leaders in the first year, and five were profitable in year one. And that is an accomplishment for those business owners who are listening. Dan, welcome. Thanks for joining us on the show. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Let's let's talk about um, the anticipatory organization because we were chatting prior to the start of the interview and you wanting to really clarify how applicable this book is for everybody. And I couldn't agree more. Well, absolutely. I mean, you know, basically things happen to us from the outside in and we react. But to control our destiny, we need to create change from the inside out. It's an opposite approach. And change, technology change, is accelerating how, uh, uh, at an exponential rate. But if you're moving exponentially fast in the wrong direction, you can get into trouble exponentially faster. In other words, how do we find direction? And uh, th- so far, uh, th- think of it as two sides of a coin. A lot of us have learned how to be agile. In other words, react quickly to changes that are taking place or problems that occur. But uh, that is a reactive strategy. And what I'm doing for individuals, for leaders, and for organizations is showing you the other side of the coin. It's a new competency, and that is the ability to anticipate problems before you have them so you can pre-solve them and not have them in the first place. Anticipate disruptions and change before it happens, turning it into a choice, and even anticipate amazing new opportunities. So what I hear you saying is you're uh helping us have a, a crystal ball in a, in a certain sense. When we anticipate, we're, we're trying to foresee what could possibly happen. Um, yes, I think it's really helpful, but we how, how do we do that? How do we actually anticipate every angle of a situation? Well, I think the key is you cannot accurately predict everything. The key is you can accurately predict far more than you realize and enough to make a very big difference. And uh, I've done that, and this is uh, actually book number seven. The others have been New York Times, Wall Street Journal bestsellers. So I'm not new at this game. I've been doing this for over 35 years. So it's a proven methodology. So let me just kind of give it to you very quickly. Um, There's no shortage of trends about where the future is going. And after all, we're going to spend the rest of our life in the future. It's good to think about it a little bit. The trouble is, which ones are going to happen? So one of the keys to the new book is separating what I call the hard trends that are fully predictable from the soft trends that are the ifs and maybes, those things that might happen. And uh, and if you have certainty about something that will happen, you know this will happen, you have the confidence to make a bold move. You have the ability to say yes uh, rather than I'll have to get another opinion or think about this. So by seeing what will happen, and there are three categories very quickly. One is demographics. For example, there's 78 million baby boomers, and they're going to get older. They're not going to get younger. They're going to get older. That's a hard trend. And we can predict a lot of problems as well as a lot of opportunities based on that. There's also government regulation as a second of the three categories. And there are amazing opportunities in regulation. Most of us just don't like regulation, so we never find them. This is the way to see them, even for individuals. And third is, again, being able to see technology. And without being a technologist, you don't need to know the physics of a telephone to use it. You have to know it exists and then creatively use it. And I think we've got amazing untapped creativity in all of our listeners out there. What I want to do is help you to create your ideal future by becoming anticipatory. So the steps beyond identifying these three categories of the trends, the government regulations, and technology, what do we do next? Okay, we recognize you know, certain things are trending. Wallabies are trending. Now what? Good. Thank you. Uh, let me give an example. Well, may, let's make it solid. Um, I uh, live most of the year in uh, California, and in January, there were 1,000 new laws that were passed. One of those laws said that Within three years, this is a law, a real law, uh, kindergartners and first graders, half of their reading within three years has to be nonfiction. Right now, it's all fiction. And when you hear that as a law, you say, well, why are they doing that? This is stupid. Aren't there more important things they should be doing? But I believe in doing the opposite. Instead of all the things you don't like, look at what you do like. So a 28-year-old teacher 
in San Diego made three phone calls. He called the San Diego School District, the Los Angeles School District, and the San Francisco School District and said, hey, you got this law it takes place in three years. If I provide the nonfiction books for your kindergartners and first graders, would you be interested? And they said, yeah, we didn't know how we we're going to do that. To make a long story short, they underwrote her business, guaranteed her them being huge customers, and she didn't have to go on Shark Tank. In other words, there's a method for finding the opportunity instead of seeing the crisis. You know, we think you know, we think the good old days of brick and mortar retail are behind us. And if you think that way, you'll close 170 Sears stores as the CEO did. But if you think the good old days of brick and mortar retail are ahead of us, they just don't look like the days behind us. You might buy Whole Foods as mm -hmm. Amazon did. So where is, what is your view of the future? And as a matter of fact, uh, if you can give me one second on that, let me just give you this concept because I think it ties into the foundation of your program. And that is how you, how we all, how our kids, how we view the future to a great extent shapes how we act in the present. Um, hey, if, if you, uh, some people are buying Apple right now and some people are selling it because of their future view of Apple. Some kids are thinking of going to college and others are thinking of going to drugs because of their future view. How you view the future shapes how you act. And by the way, how you act will shape your future. Your future view will determine the future you. And I believe our future view is based on the past, not all the amazing opportunities ahead of us. And all those amazing opportunities are fogged in by the news. And I want us to blow away the fog and start seeing the amazing opportunity for every person listening to this show, your families and your businesses. I love your message. I absolutely love it because it's really about perspective, right? Do you, do you see your life as opportunity or adversity? And what you're saying is that it's not just taking an internal view, but it's actually calling upon us to take an external view to pay attention to what we see to read the news to to or, or, you know read the newspaper even what a, what a concept and and see what's going on around us and see where our interests can then match with opportunities we can create exactly you know there's an old statement if you do what you've always done you'll get what you've always had but in today's world if you do what you've always done you'll get less than you've always had because the world has changed we got a, a unique human tipping point that we've never reached ever before in human history. We're doing things today that were impossible just two years ago, which by the way means two years from now we're doing things that are impossible today. This book shows you how to see those things before they happen. How to, and this is one of the reasons I'm very passionate about this book, if all we're doing is solving problems after they happen in a world of exponentially driven change, we're not going to be happy campers on this planet. I want us all as individuals to, number one, see the problems before they happen and pre-solve them. And secondly, to shape, actively shape the future rather than passively receive it. Oh. You see, we can hope is not a strategy. And I want to influence what we can influence. And certainty is a key to doing that. That's why I wrote uh, the anticipatory organization. Because by learning to anticipate you have certainty in an uncertain world. And very quickly, strategy, whether it's personal or business, that's based on uncertainty has high risk. Strategy based on certainty has low risk and high reward. So it's really, how do you find certainty in a seemingly uncertain world? And we're talking with Daniel Burris about his new book, The Anticipatory Organization, Turn Disruption and Change into Opportunity and Advantage. And he's talking about the future view determines the future you. And I love that phrase. I'm, I'm going to, with your permission, I'm going to, I'm going to reuse that because it's really wonderful. And it's true. It's true. You know, it's like wherever you focus your attention is where you will find yourself. Absolutely. And I believe that our future view, and I'm talking about all of us now, and I'm especially talking about your kids' future view, it's based on a rear view, mirror view of the future rather than a windshield. You see, why is your windshield larger than your rear view mirror? Helps to know it's up ahead. And when we all think, and when we all are thinking about the future, we're using our past perspective. Everything that we've known, everything that we've learned 
But today, we are in a game-changing world. The game is being changed, and it can be positive or negative. It's up to us. You see, the soft trend, the if or maybe a part, is will the future be better than the past? Well, I don't know. That's I can't predict that, but I can predict with certainty that there are tools out there to create a far better world than we've ever had. Soft trends, the reason I like them, you can change them. So if things yeah. aren't doing that well for you, hey, change it. And I've got a good example I can give you after we uh, take a little break, but uh, I, I want you to see the power of both hard trends and the soft trend, because hard trends will happen. The good news about soft trends is you can change them if you don't like them. And let's take that break now to learn more about Daniel Burris and all of his books, including the newest, The Anticipatory Organization, Turn Disruption and Change into Opportunity and Advantage. You can find him at www.burris.com, on Twitter at Daniel Burris, and on Facebook, that page is also Daniel Burris. We'll pause briefly and then return to the conversation with Daniel Burris. Who says money can't buy happiness? Whether you are a skeptic or seeker, check out Lisa's new book, Are We Happy Yet? Eight Keys to Unlocking a Joyful Life, a boot camp manual for greater emotional fitness, is available at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, IndieBound, and HarvestingHappiness.com. Here's a truth bomb. Emotions are contagious, and happiness is a universally desired state. But we tend to forget that we all have the freedom to be happy or the liberty to be miserable each day, regardless of external circumstances. Explore the journey of human happiness, how to find it and keep it, with Lisa's documentary film, H Factor. Where is your heart? Visit HarvestingHappiness.com to learn more. We're back continuing the conversation with Daniel Burris that originally aired in June of 2018. We're talking about personal agency and positive disruption. Let's get back to it. So, Daniel, in the last segment, we were talking about identifying trends, regulation, and technology as three segments to look at when looking for opportunities for creating this positive disruption. I'd like to talk more about how to become the disruptor. So how to be more of the um, initiator rather than the recipient of life circumstances. Absolutely, thank you. Well, first of all, for those that want more, if you go to B-U-R-R-U-S, some people might type in I-S, you will find uh, uh, on that website Uh, a lot of articles about how to do this, but there are three categories, and then I'll talk about the disruption. One, remember, is technology. Second is the demographics, and the third is regulation that allow you to see the future. Those give you hard trend certainties. And then one other comment, soft trends are are based on assumptions. They're not based on future facts. And in those cases, you can change them if you don't like them. So your question was, disruption and change, how can we turn that into an advantage? And, you know, the kind of change that people don't like is the kind that affects them personally and they didn't see it coming. But most of those changes you could have seen, you just weren't looking. Hey, when did people get burglar alarms? After getting robbed. When did people start working on on their health? And it's when the doctor says, hey, you're huge. You got to get up. You got to walk around a little bit, you know, get out of that chair. When, you know, so we react instead of anticipate. So in the case of disruption, Uh, When you take a look at the book and my blogs and so on, you'll learn how to actually identify these hard trends, these certainties, and then, and again, they haven't happened yet, but you can see with confidence that they will happen, making disruption a choice. Because change and disruption are a choice when you see it before it happens. It's a default problem if you don't see them ahead of time. And again, that's why I was passionate about uh, being able to do this. As a matter of fact, let me give you a healthcare example, since healthcare is always on our minds. And that is, I was just speaking to CEOs, a uh, large number of CEOs of hospitals and uh, healthcare facilities, and they all are making the same assumption all of us make, and that is that healthcare costs will continue to rise, and they are thinking that's a future fact. But in reality, 
That's a soft trend that can be changed. Um, if we think it's a future fact, we'll just let it continue to rise because we yeah. all think there's nothing you can do about it. But in reality, you could wipe billions of dollars of waste out of healthcare if you used existing technology right now to transform for hospitals, purchasing, logistics, supply chain. If we used a technology called blockchain to bring transparency to healthcare prices, you wouldn't be paying $300 for an aspirin in a hospital. And you know what? We could actually lower health care costs. So you see, we make assumptions and think they're facts. And one of the things which can add to a lot of risk and uh, less of a future than you could have had. So in the book, what I'm doing is really helping people separate future facts from future assumptions because they carry different levels of risks. And you can change a soft trend if you don't like it. For example, I don't like rising health care costs. Well, let's change that. Um, we've got increasing obesity in the United States. Been a trend for over 15 years. You think you can't change that? Yes, you can. That's a soft trend. For example, my sister is an executive at Manpower, and two years ago they gave everybody in the company, and by the way, it's a global company, they gave everybody globally Fitbits and have weekly and monthly uh, challenges and prizes. Well, they've gotten off of cholesterol drugs. They've lowered their weight. In other words, they've actually got thinner and they have less health care bills. In other words, they may not be able to change the world, but that's a soft trend. They changed it for them. So what are the things you think you can't change? You know what? I think that's an assumption. I bet you could change those. And one other that I think you will really like, and that is one of the tenets of the book. Uh, again, there's a bunch of principles in the book. I've got 25 ways of shaping the future by being anticipatory. One of them is take your biggest problem and skip it. And I got a feeling you'll like this one. <laughs> I, I, I like that title. <laughs> yeah. And you see, whatever problem you've got, well, that's not it. Hey, you're smart. You would have solved it by now if you're working at the right, on the right one. So I teach how to like peel an onion, how to peel it back to find the real problem, which is actually quite solvable. That is one element to it. And another element to it is to skip the problem altogether. Let me give you a very simple, practical example that just came up for me just recently. I got a call from one of my nieces. She's got her first job. And she said, Uncle Dan, I can't save money. I'm trying really hard. By the way, she knows it's possible because she's got an older sister that is able to save money like crazy. But this younger one can't save money. She has trouble. She says, I'm trying to save money. I can't. And I said, well, no wonder. It's the wrong problem. Why don't you work at how you spend money instead? If you change how you spend money, you'll save money by default. You see, she was working on the wrong one. All of us are working on the wrong one. That's why you can't solve it. In the book, I show how to peel the onion. Well, you know, you, you talk about healthcare. Let's go back to that because it's a great example. It's 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 not about cutting healthcare costs. It's about improving lifestyle. So exactly. The costs it's, are less. Like, that's the Fitbit solution, right? So, you, it, it, and I, I think it's important to point out that it's helping people see that there's another logic that's required to problem solve in this way. Yeah, I'm working with a company right now. They've got a technology that'll be out and actually in kiosks and shopping centers and so on. And what you do is um, you uh, look at the, uh, at the kiosk or your computer screen and you see yourself. There's a, it's like a video. And uh, what you do is you answer a number of questions. You know, do you smoke? Do you exercise? How often? You answer about 15 questions, and then you dial the clock ahead 20 years and see what you look like. And oh, then, fabulous! And, and then you know, <laughs> and then you know what you can do: change some of the answers and see how it affects you. And uh, and you know what? That helps to see the future. It helps you to become anticipatory. And what am I talking about? I want to predict problems before they happen and pre-solve them so I don't have them. Yeah. Well, that's uh, okay. I'm giving you an example. Yeah. It's right? a, no, it's a really, really good example. You talk about what it means to be an opportunity manager. Elaborate on that. Well, and that gives me uh, uh, the thank you, the opportunity to give everyone an action in this interview. And that is that we tend to crisis manage our lives. We put out fires. We deal with the, the current situation. And, uh, and I believe we need to actively shape the future. We need to ask ourselves, what is the ideal future for you, for your family, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, and then plan backwards 
getting more vague as you get towards the present. Why? Because now you know the direction. Yeah. And, and if you plan real specific for this year and next year, you may be going in the wrong direction because you didn't think of where you're really trying to head. So I want us to be thinking about that and to be the opportunity manager and not just the crisis manager. manager here's an action for you right now. And that is, I would like you to spend one hour a week, by the way, this is doable, one hour a week, unplug from the crisis, the current situation. And by the way, hint, put this in your calendar, make an appointment, because if you don't, you'll just be in a, putting out another fire. But this is about opportunity managing and shaping your future. So in that hour, instead of looking at all the things you're uncertain about, why don't you define all of the hard trend certainties that are shaping the future you are certain about because that has power instead of looking at all and, and when you come up with a certainty tied to an opportunity because I, I think a trend, whether it's a hard trend or a soft, is worthless unless you tie it to an opportunity. Then it, boom, pops into life and you'll get a, you'll get a lot of them. And then big, big lists never get done. I don't want you to focus on the could do's or the should do's. Pick one or two must-dos and make it happen. You know, I, I want to jump in here because I think it's important to clarify for people or bring to their attention. You talk about an hour a week. That is about what? About, uh, what, nine minutes, ten minutes a day? Yeah. Eight minutes a day? Seven, oh, seven and a half minutes a day. My, my math is terrible. Everybody out there has seven and a half minutes a day when uh, they would normally be noodling around on the internet for nonsense to, <laughs> to, to commit to being the opportunity manager and shaping our personal future. I mean, I get it. It's, it's very little investment for a huge return. A huge return because we all can do far more than we think. You know, uh, I was giving a commencement speech not long ago and, uh, you know, this last spring, and there's two things I'll point out very quickly. Number one was... Uh, don't try to create success for yourself because that's inwardly focused. Instead of a successful life, why don't you create a significant life because that's focused on others? And secondly, think big about your future and realize you just thought small. There's actually a bigger big. Never do the big, always do the bigger big. And the reason I wrote the anticipatory organization is to help people to actively shape a positive future for themselves and for others to not just react, but to anticipate because there's so much opportunity. I want you to see it. Thank you, Daniel Burris, for being my guest today. The book, once again, is The Anticipatory Organization, Turn Disruption and Change into Opportunity and Advantage. You can learn more at www.burris.com, on Twitter at Daniel Burris, and on Facebook, Daniel Burris. Dan Burris, thanks for being with me. Hey, it was my pleasure. Thanks for joining us on Harvesting Happiness today. This is Lisa Cypress Kamen on behalf of my guests, Dr. Paul Knapper and Daniel Burris, wishing you kind thoughts, kinder words, and the kindest of actions. Until next time, remember, happiness is an inside job. Happiness is your inside job. Please go out and rock your day and remember to be kind to one another. Keep harvesting your own happiness anytime and anywhere from the comfort of wherever you are. Subscribe, listen, and share hundreds of downloadable episodes via our free app or from our libraries at toginet.com, iTunes, Google Play, and other fine podcast platforms. To learn more about Lisa's global consulting services, please visit harvestinghappiness.com. Spread more joy by liking us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness and following Lisa on Twitter at Lisa Kamen. Harvesting Happiness is produced in collaboration with Toginet Radio. KBUU Radio Malibu.net and is available on PRX, the public radio exchange. <laughs>